My name is Molly Rockman, and I'm the founder and CEO of Earth Dance Organic Farm School. My name is Macaulay Ginkade. We farm around 880 acres of row crop, 128 acres of pasture. Uh, we are 100% uh, no-till, 100% cover crop land. We integrate cattle on most of our on our, most of our row crop land as well. I am Jennifer Allen, and my husband Scott and I um, actually purchased this farm just north of St. Catherine in 2015. Um, so it's very much a work in progress, but um, we've got um, hair sheep, cattle, hogs, chickens, goats, <laughs> kind of the whole menagerie. There's a lot of practices that we do here to encourage pollinator health and habitat. Every time that we allow a crop to actually go to flower and rather than just take it out right away and put something new in, we know that there's certain insects that are at the life cycle where they're gonna need that pollen. We also just have a lot of perennial plantings that are primarily for the sake of encouraging pollinators. Interplanted between all of our fruit trees, we have a mix of native perennials that are great at attracting pollinators, um, low growing shrubs and ground covers, and really just kind of mimicking a forest environment, but producing a lot of food for both humans and pollinators. So our orchard is really unconventional in that we actually have the fruit trees spread all throughout the farm. We have um, over 200 fruit trees as well as ground covers and shrubs um, growing everything from pawpaws to Asian pears to plums, peaches, tart cherries, apples, European pears, strawberries in, in the same area yarrow, Egyptian walking onions, all sorts of things. So um, these, this orchard is highly, highly productive and a lot of attention has been given to um, planting a lot of perennials that are gonna attract pollinators to the orchard as well. Earth Dance is home to the rarest native bee species in North America. We found that out because of partnering with researchers at the St. Louis University. So we're, we grow a lot of white clover um, just to give, you can even see the bees are loving it, just as a good crop to grow in the path rather than just grass. We had the great privilege of having bees on our farm uh, this past year. And the lady, uh, she lives in Lamar, which is about 15 miles north of me. She's never had as much honey, which I will say, we had a sunflower field with about 20 other different species growing underneath it. So there's a lot of flowers out there, a lot of blooms. Honey is actually 80% grass pollen. We think about like legumes and blueberries or whatever, you know, being a big source of their, of their pollenies, but it's actually the grasses that are a huge part of that. So you think about that for a second, the native prairies were mostly all grasses, right? Grass and forbs, but a lot of grass species. So that grass pollen is such an important part of honey, which we don't think about that. One of the things great about our system too, since we've discontinued insecticides completely, I don't care what my counts are, my threshold levels or my aphids, I'm not going to spray. I don't care what they are. I've just decided that I will give up yield before I sacrifice our pollinators. So in our pasture, it's just beautiful because I know if we've got honeybees out there, there's nothing that can damage them. There's nothing that can harm them that I've applied. There might be some natural things, you know, but there's nothing that I know that I have physically applied that can harm any, any pollinator or any insect for that matter. We, we get so focused on the pollinators, but there's so many others that are so important. Dragonflies, ladybugs, these predator insects are so important too. And then we've also tiled out our wet holes. A lot of these insects have to have those wet holes to nest their eggs in, correct? So, you know, we've destroyed the environmental context. We've created all these mass monocultures. That's why I truly believe the most sustainable system will be perennial pastures that are properly grazed. In our experience, the bug health is an indicator of the soil health. And then with a magnitude of good bugs and a wide variety of bugs, then you also have food for a lot of different birds. We've got some pretty intense ditches um, and we wanted to fence those out so the cattle weren't in there lounging. They're along those ditches. We wanted to plant some shrubs for wildlife to go between the, the grassland and the trees that are in that ditch line. One of the benefits we get would be more pollinators. Um, between the bees and the butterflies with that riparian zone through there. 
there's definitely good bugs and bad bugs. And if you've got a healthy population of good bugs, you're gonna have fewer bad bugs, has been my experience. So I want those good bugs to be around. When we brush hog in the fall, um, just because we're trying to keep thistles and that sort of thing down, um, it's always fun to look at the top of the brush hog and see the magnitude of bugs. I mean, like weird bugs, lots of bugs. Um, and we didn't have that as much when we first started. But when you have a pretty sterile environment, you don't have as many bugs and you don't have as many birds because those birds that feed on those bugs, what are they gonna eat? 